This is a download from Rutland Radio. Hello and thank you for downloading the Rutland Radio podcast from rutlandradio.co.uk. This is where you can hear the best bits from the last week. Now, you're Head of Keyboard and Music Technology at Uppingham School. The yeah. school must be very proud of your achievements. Well, what I will say is that um, they are incredibly supportive. The headmaster, Dr Maloney, is so supportive of me and others who obviously are, are active in their chosen professions and I'm enormously grateful for that. Now, I suppose for a lot of uh, local people who've maybe seen the Uppingham Children's Choir, they've seen you supporting that. Your wife, of course, leads the choir and your children have uh, both sung in it over the years. You know, it's an incredible choir and and Leslie, my wife, runs it uh, with such enthusiasm and passion and, and talent, I have to say. And so I'm very proud of everything that she does with the choir. For Leslie, I guess it hasn't been an overnight because obviously we've been together since we were students at 18 and so she's seen the ups and downs of a professional musician's life and the success that I've had is very much shared with Leslie in equal measure. Certainly I wouldn't have been able to do the things I have done without her support. And tell us about Bluebird. Now we're not known for playing our instrumentals here but it does almost have a kind of vocal to it if you know what I mean. Yeah, well, that's, that's very astute, Rob. I remember my father-in-law saying to me years ago, and, and don't forget, everyone loves a good tune, Alexis. You know, and as a brass band musician himself, he was no stranger to lyricism of song and good tunes. And that's something I've held dear. And, and actually, I, even, you know, in, in my travels recently, going over to Paris and meeting lots of people from the label Sony to others, that's something they've all commented on. So, yeah, it's, it's very much a song without words, really, and, and something that grew out of the work that I did with my daughter years back, composing for her as a dancer. And so it was lovely to uh, feature that song and also to have Savannah as a dancer in the video for Bluebird. So will you be performing locally soon? I know you've uh, performed it in Nottingham fairly recently. In terms of immediate plans, I think uh, what we've got at the moment is writing the album. I'm here actually in my office at the moment. And I think there are some plans rather further afield. I've got a Japanese action movie, which I've just been commissioned to do as well. And then Boston, Massachusetts. I've got a concert over there. I'm not sure whether there are any UK plans imminently, but certainly when the album comes out, which I think is May, June, then we'll be looking to play locally as well as uh, internationally as well. Alexis French, thank you very much for joining us on Rutland Radio. We look forward to hearing Bluebird, and if anyone hasn't heard this yet, I'm sure they'll be blown away by something that we don't ever hear on Rutland Radio until now, I think. Uh, Well, Rob, thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. And um, Happy New Year when it comes to all the Rutland Radio listeners. Highlights from the past seven days, the Rutland Radio podcast. Leave it to Lydia is back and this was my latest challenge. So I'm with Naomi Morgan from the Rutland Cake Company, my first challenge of 2018. We're going to be decorating cakes. We are, it's going to be fun. (laughs) So it does sound really fun, but with cake decorating, it always looks so gorgeous and beautiful. But I'm guessing it's a lot harder than you think it's going to be. I think it's practice, quite Mm. honestly, having a really good recipe to start with. And what about if you make a mistake? Because it's not like you can just rub it out on the cake. Well, oh gosh. can you? Yeah, it completely depends because actually the cake that you're going to be doing today, it doesn't really matter too much if you make a mistake. Okay, so talk me through what we're going to be doing today. You're going to do uh, a drip cake. A drip cake? What on earth is a drip cake? Well, I discovered it's a decorated cake with chocolate that then drips down the sides. Looks pretty effective, actually. Looks really nice. But um, I'd say that it wasn't the smoothest ride getting to the finished product, starting with making sure that the cake was level. If you can level that up a little bit, you want to take more off this side? Yeah, we can just make it not so tall. That big bowl of buttercream next to you, you're going to take with your trusty knife, mm-hmm. you're going to put a blob on your board. And here? Yeah. Okay. The trick is to not get any crumbs back in the bath cream because you will be cursing. I know it's tricky, isn't it? Because you get I've crumbs. I've got crumbs I know. <laughs> it's a nightmare. <laughs> crumbs are the bane of our lives. Lovely. So pop that on. And just want to kind of smoosh it around a bit. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's literally just going to stick the cake to the board. It's kind of like um, plastering. That's it. Plastering it's with buttercream. Similar. And then, oh, hold on a second. Put something on the bottom. That's it. Oh, no. Get the, um... The wrapper. Oh, dear.
I got crumbs on the spatula back in the buttercream. That paper wrapper thing on the bottom of the cake. Left it on. Nearly, nearly ended up in the middle of the cake. It's like a blooper reel for a cooking show, but we got there in the end. And I'm going to make you hungry now because the cake actually turned out quite nice. It was a tripled layered Victoria sponge cake covered with purple and green um, buttercream that kind of blended together around the sides so it looked all mushy and nice and uh, then on top green sprinkles and buttercream piping and a Rutland Radio logo and you can find a photo of the cake on our social media also on our website as well click on, click on my page on, um, on our website rutlandradio.co.uk and then onto the leave it to Lydia section Rutland Radio's best bids on the podcast hello Hello, Rob. Hello, Judith. Lovely to speak to you. Yes, how are things? <laughs> yes, very good, thank you. I heard that uh, when Mary Berry opened oh. the Stamford High School new cookery atrium, uh, <laughs> she then went to lunch at the George with you. Oh, good Lord. Absolutely right. <laughs> Mary did her first demonstration of cookery on my afternoon programme at Thames. Oh, of course, yeah. In 1976, she did her first programme. Oh, she's a good chum. I don't see her very much. Mark's just been working with her in the Midlands at the food fair in Birmingham, which is the one time that she's done that. We had a very nice Christmas card from her saying that it was all great fun, you know, and how the years roll by. (laughs) She's great, isn't she? I think she looks fantastic and she is fantastic. Anyway, you're good, Rob. Yes, I'm very good, thank you very much. Yes, and let's talk holidays and uh, the increasing amount of people that like to holiday in this country through your many years of wish you were here you often seem to be the one who was uh, going abroad um, (laughs) and taking these uh, amazing sunshine packed holidays and yet you know you can get so much on our our doorstep can't you i promise you we said we would have a british story in every program and i did do them whether you uh, (laughs) i always thought it was john carter on a beach I promise you, I did do British ones, very much loved them too. But what's happening now, of course, is that people are having many more holidays. Brits are staying at home because they're realising what a lovely country we have, perhaps concerned a bit about incidents abroad that might happen. But um, they're relishing the fact that they are in Britain and we've got some smashing places. The Weekly Rutland Radio Podcast. So for my latest Leave It to Lydia task, I had a go at decorating a cake with Naomi Morgan, owner of Rutland Cake Company in Oakham, and I asked her for her tips when baking. So I would say start with a really good recipe and use butter as well because it'll make your cake a lot firmer, um, unless obviously you're dairy-free or, you know, uh, you've got any other kind of allergies or anything. I would say go for butter... Uh, that For that size cake there, that is a six inch cake that you're decorating and that is 250 grams of butter. Oh my gosh. Two, I know, it's a whole pack of butter in that little cake. So 250 grams of butter, 250 cast sugar, same of self-raising flour and eggs and vanilla and a drop of whole milk and that's it basically. So that makes a really nice tall, tall and tiny cake. Give yourself a bit of time, make sure your cake is cold to start with and we've just fridged it. Once we've done the crumb coat, we've fridged it. So try not to be in a rush with them. They, I have to have a little bit of patience. How can you do the perfect crumb coat? Because my attempt was, okay. No, it was a very good start. <laughs> it was a very good start. I, cold cake, soft buttercream, and just um, practice. Uh, you know, you can start with it. You can do a bit, then fridge it, and then try again. Um, and it's just persisting, really. Also, can I ask how you got into um, baking? Oh, my goodness. OK, where do we start? I've always baked since I was little, actually. I was one of the first semi-finalists for Master Chef Junior. Oh, my gosh. Which is quite a while ago. That was very funny. It was before it was televised. Basically, I think it was about nine years ago or so, I was, pretty, I was suffering from depression and... Um, I read about a lady who started making biscuits and she found that was kind of therapeutic for her. So I basically started, I thought, right, this is it, I'm going to bake, it's going to be a great hobby. So I just started baking for anyone who would have some cake, basically. And I had a lot of friends who put up with a lot of bad cake, quite honestly. Um, And then a few years ago, I started doing cakes from home. 
and then I thought, right, no, this is this is ridiculous. I need a proper job. I had I had the kids. Um, I felt like I wanted to do something. I'd previously been working with my husband, and um, I thought I wanted something for myself. So it just it's it's crazy, really, because we started doing the farmers market and doing like lots of market research and things. And um, it just snowballed, quite honestly, because I was quite happy doing them from home. It was a bit crazy in my kitchen. Um, I looked around Oak Enterprise Parks. So I thought well, I could do with something bigger, not really thinking anything would happen. We ended up build, building this place. Suddenly this proper business, <laughs> so to speak, that started from a hobby, really. Um, but yeah. So what would you say to someone who it's t- they think it's 2018, I want to start a new hobby, I'm going to get into baking, what would you say to them? Oh, oh yeah, baking's a lovely hobby and I think it's, it's one of those, it's quite relaxing. I would say stick to the traditional recipes is the way for success and I think if you have a good success with a cake you're more likely to continue and I think there are millions of recipes out there but Delia Smith, Mary Berry, WI, all those recipes um, for like a traditional Victoria are really reliable. Well that's it for this week's Rutland Radio podcast. If you have any comments you can email us via the website rutlandradio.co.uk and we'll have a new version on our website from Monday. This is a download from Rutland Radio. For more information go to rutlandradio.co.uk This is a download from Rutland Radio. Hello, and thank you for downloading the Rutland Radio podcast from rutlandradio.co.uk. This is where you can hear the best bits from the last week. So back at the Sanford Santa Fun Run, Darren Grigas just happened upon this because he was actually in training uh, for his next adventure. Now, Darren, we've spoken to you a lot of times, uh, raising money for the Stanford charity Anna's Hope, quite a lot of money over the years, thousands in fact. Um, the, um, the marathon to Salva was your, your big thing, running yep. six or seven marathons in the, those desert conditions. But what's next? At the end of January, I'm heading to Outer Mongolia, as you do, to try a world first run in the length of 100 miles across a frozen lake in temperatures down to about minus 40. That's incredible. I mean, here we are speaking at Burley Park and temperatures around freezing point. You yeah. just can't imagine that, really. No, it's very new to me. Obviously, I've done the desert and I've done Scotland and different things, but those conditions, obviously, it's dangerously cold, so I've got a lot to learn about how to, well, survive and come back with all my body parts still connected. Yeah, wow. That, that is quite an incredible thing. Just as we think you can't actually top what you did before, how on earth do you find out about something like that? This was actually invited by the rap race team. This is going to be kind of an expedition to see if it can be done and potentially turned into one of their new bucket list events where they're going to try some world first attempts dotted around the world. So 100 miles and in what sort of time do you think? It'll be over three days, so across this frozen lake and it is a monster of a thing. About 22 miles wide at its widest point and it's in a huge nature park bigger than Yellowstone and it's inhabited by wolves, bears, lynxes and various other big sharp toothed creatures that can run faster than me. (laughs) Wow. What do you wear on your feet actually for something like that? I believe, I'm, obviously I'm still learning, but I believe it's just certain like proper good snow boots, but they have like little studs on so we don't slip so much on the ice. Like today, we've got, we're have got we caked in snow all over Burley here. There's a few people slipping about, so it's yeah, just get the right footwear and I guess a lot of snug clothing, really. Very best of luck. So how will people find out about this if they'd like to support you? I've got a Just Giving page on there, that is, and it's Just Giving forward slash fundraising Mongolian ice challenge. And uh, Carol of um, Anna's Hope will be posting some things online because I'll be trying to raise money for them and hope we can raise more money and awareness through publicising this. And, yeah, so look out for Anna's Hope and whatever things I manage to get out on social media. Rutland Radio. Here with Mark Stanier of Stamford Amateur Boxing Club. Now, um, you're being um, forced to leave where you are at the moment, the fire station. That's right, yeah, we've been at the fire station for the last six or seven years and uh, they're, well, they're actually moving the ambulance service into there as well, so uh, we're having to vacate there and looking for new premises. So um, that's part of why you're doing the Santa Fun Run today. How big's your team? The team is, I think, 19, last counting. Yeah, so the, the plan, original plan was to have two teams, a fast team and a not-so-fast team, but then when we saw the weather this morning, we just kind of said, well, we'll just get around without breaking any ankles. <laughs> and... Um, how big actually is the club? Because I mean, you're training a couple of times a week. Yeah, we train three times a week at the moment, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Um, there's, well, it varies. We get about 40 people a night. 
Um, but coming and going is sort of 120, 150 people perhaps in total. Yeah. Uh, what sort of premises are you looking for? Something bespoke to you or, or a sports centre you could use? Uh, we're looking for absolutely anywhere. The, the, the main sort of uh, well, sticking point, the tricky bit is we need a ring in there and that needs to be put all the time. So kind of school sports halls, that rules us out from that sort of thing. Mm. But yeah, an, anywhere that's, um, that can accommodate a ring. You know. And if you were actually going to do that yourself, I mean, what sort of cost would you be looking at? Yeah, well, we'd probably be looking at seven, eight hundred pounds a month. Um, so that's you know our subs wouldn't cover that alone. Yeah, so it's we a lot keep to it raise, cheap so absolutely. people can come here and yeah. So. And and what about competitions um, locally? You know, I, I, I do see stuff on social media where you're competing. Yeah, we have a lot. We've got three guys out tomorrow night down at Bedford. Um, so they've been running today. Well, they're under strict instructions not to run too fast, but uh, they've been jogging around today to keep their energy up. Uh, yeah, we're regularly out, probably two, three times a month. We've got people out. Yeah. It's best to find you on social media if anyone has got any suggestions. Yeah, anyone can help. Facebook, Instagram, yeah, we're all on there. Stand for ABC. Highlights from the past seven days, the Rutland Radio podcast. Hello. Hello, Mary, it's Rob from Rutland Radio. Oh, hello. £500 on the Mystery Voice. Yes. You entered on the website, didn't you? Yes. This is The Voice. Wonderful part. Who did you say it was out of Will Young, Gareth Gates or Ollie Murs? Um, I'm hoping, from my memory, that I ticked Will Young. You ticked Will Young. It's such a wonderful part. I mean, there's really not many parts like that. Full stop. How about this to start a Friday? You've won £500 from Newton Fallowell of Stamford and Oakham. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. Oh, that is amazing. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We had hundreds of entries. Your name came out at random and uh, you were £500 richer. Oh, my God, what a perfect day. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That is absolutely astounding. You're on your way to work at the moment? Um, yes, yes, I'm on my way to work on my day off because my school is going to Young Voices today. Wow. And I've this... been lucky enough to go with them, so this is just the perfect, perfect day. There have been schools all over our area going to Young Voices at Birmingham all this week, haven't there? So Uppingham C of E is going to be singing later. Yes, yes, our Woodpecker's class is going to be singing at Young Voices as part of the choir. It's, yeah, it's an amazing opportunity for the kids, a once-in-a-lifetime sort of thing to look at over the thousands of parents and adults. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah. I'm speechless. I'm sorry, Rob. No, don't be uh, don't be sorry at all, Mrs. Whitmore of Uppingham C of E. Uh, you have won. Oh, thank you so much. That's wonderful. Rutland Radio's best bids on the podcast. Is the Oakham Warmway system proposal definitely off now? Is it? Is it? Is it dead in the water, as it were? No, it's certainly not dead in the water. Uh, what we've decided is from the sort of uh, support that we've had that there clearly needed to be uh, some reassessment of what was needed and therefore we really want to just go back and sort of get the people around the table, have a discussion and, and move forward with something that is uh, more supported by, you know, the people obviously have a, a view that it was the wrong thing to do. This is going to happen over the next year or so because you're allowing this sort of period for the town to settle, you know, after all the road works. Does the town really need that period of time? I think it does. You know, they've had, you know, a year and a half of road works and that was one of the questions or concerns that was raised by shopkeepers in town. And while in principle it seemed to be a good idea to carry on and get a project underway and done, I think it's given the breathing time and to allow us to collect our thoughts and actually really get something that will work for Oakham, our county town, would be the best thing to move forward. So would it have to be a one-way system, or is it something that's subject to change? Could you go back to the drawing board, maybe look at the other option, which was the two-way traffic? We certainly could. I mean, the one-way system met a lot of the things that we would like to see change in Oakham, but you know, we're open to discussion, so it doesn't have to be one-way. We did look at other options before we got there anyway. Are there going to be small things happening, you know, maybe a bit of repainting, you know, a few benches replaced, something like that? It to do things that we would maybe undo later so if there's certain areas we felt we could do things that would be there for the future then certainly we would do that but I wouldn't like to say yet you know what we will or won't do. Do you think fundamentally the one-way system is still needed is it something that's you still think is a good idea? I do still think it's a good 
good idea. I think that you know the information that's been provided around it and some of the misinformation that's been provided around it has caused some of the anxiety about it. I think it serves the needs for the town, but maybe we need to discuss those better and sell the picture better. But it doesn't have to be a one-way system, but that actually met our requirements of lots of different areas within Oakham. What do you think went wrong with the process? Because, you know, there was a consultation, but it didn't, you know, satisfy local people and their concerns. I don't think anything really went wrong. It was one of the biggest uh, consultation projects that Rutland County Council has ever undertaken. And, you know, I felt it was quite well attended, not having a lot of experience of them. But, you know, the questions were genuine, the inquiries were genuine, and the people were a mix right across the county. I just think that it is a change, and some people got very upset about what may be happening and were misinformed on, you know, reduced numbers of parking spaces, congestion and things, because they were looking at the roadworks, which gave them a feeling of what the one-way system might be like. But obviously we had the impact of all the roadworks, so half the parking had gone and things. So I think we've got a little bit of sort of mixed messages coming through. Obviously you've got the traffic and the parking issues to solve, and that will be caught up in whatever you decide to do with the high street. But what other issues around Oakham do you want to look at over the next few months? Well, we've got a science policy coming through fairly soon, and I think you know it's great, and I've always said this, that people who live in an area shouldn't probably put the signs up directing people to it, because we all know exactly where the castle is. But we found people standing in the marketplace asking where the castle is. So, you know, signs, things like that would help. So people visiting could be able to find the car parks easily, understand how the town's laid out. You know, so there's lots of things we need to look at, but it's in a bigger picture rather than looking down in isolation. Looking across the county, and obviously you've got about a month before there's a permanent leader in place, but this is a chance to reset your priorities, as it were. Is there anything big or, you know, anything that you want to look at solving over the next year? like to achieve but I think the general direction that we were going in will remain exactly the same you know business as usual I worked very closely with Tony Mathias and clearly we had a sort of joint view of what needs to be done we want to do what's right for Rutland the weekly Rutland radio podcast and I first started driving regularly in electric car in 2010 you know and I've got used to them and they feel very normal to me but I do absolutely accept that for people who haven't driven them or have no experience of them there's a lot of sort of anxiety in the background about what how they work and when, whether they're going to run out and whether you're going to have to throw the battery away after two weeks and all that sort of stuff and it's I think what's happening now is that they've been around long enough for people to start trusting the technology. And they're very eerie aren't they when you first get in because you don't have that rev of the engine. Yes it's a very different experience I mean you get used to it pretty quick but it certainly is, yes when you turn it on you have to believe it's on you know all the lights are on on the dashboard but there's no other indication that it's on. And there is an office outside Milton Keynes that is run from all the employees' electric cars out in the car park. It doesn't drain it, it takes a little bit from each one. I literally feel like I'm talking to a man of the future, especially (laughs) especially with you having done Red Dwarf for so many years, Crichton. Yes. What an incredible character that was with the dry wit, you know. Yes, no, oh, we're still making it. We're making another series this year, so it's still going. It's our 30th anniversary this year, which is rather shocking. That's made us all feel a bit too old, but it's still going strong, yeah. Well, that's it for this week's Rutland Radio podcast. If you have any comments, you can email us via the website rutlandradio.co.uk and we'll have a new version on our website from Monday. This is a download from Rutland Radio. For more information, go to rutlandradio.co.uk. This is a download from Rutland Radio. Hello, and thank you for downloading the Rutland Radio podcast from rutlandradio.co.uk. This is where you can hear the best bits from the last week. I'm Rachel Markham, and I'm the communications officer at Charity Link. Charity Link's actually one of the oldest charities in the whole of the UK. Uh, We began our life in Leicester in 1876, would you believe? Um, And we're pretty much doing the same today as we were all those years ago, which is trying to improve the lives of local people living in hardship. So we work in Leicester, Leicestershire, Rutland and Northamptonshire. And we try to make a difference by providing essential items for people in need to make sure that they've got the basics in life. So is this like food, toiletries? Yeah, it's everything. We work very much on an individual basis. So for people in real crisis, we have an emergency fund. So that's things like food. Um, But we also provide lots of beds, cookers, fridges, furniture, clothing, and right up to things like mobility items. So it could be electric scooters, um, riser chairs, those sorts of things as well. So you've got Poverty Action Week coming up. 
Um, so do you know what you've got going on around Rutland? Um, it's pretty much the same. It's sort of a general campaign really to highlight. We do find that a lot of people think that poverty and hardship isn't something that happens in our local communities. So Poverty Action Week tries to uh, make people have a bit of a think about hardship and who finds themselves in hardship because it is all sorts of people. You know, sometimes when we talk about poverty, we think it's something happening in a third world country. But um, particularly in this day and age, it's really tough times for people. So it can be people who've lost their jobs, elderly people who are just struggling to make ends meet and even working families as well, which just, you know, it's. Sometimes they can get by day to day, but when things break, like beds, they just don't have the funds to be able to buy those. So it is the case that uh, children are sleeping on the floor. We have cases of elderly people where they're becoming poorly because they can't get um, their cookers broken, so they're not able to have a hot meal. So Poverty Action Week really just asks people to have a think about those things. And we're asking people to do very basic things like possibly not um, buy their morning coffee and possibly donate that to to support people in need right through to on the friday we have something called wear a funky scarf day which is it's quite a gloomy time of year um funky scarf day is really about people having fun wearing an, an item that's a symbol of warmth for people who possibly can't afford to keep themselves warm over winter so we're asking schools and businesses and individuals in rutland to don their funky scarves give a donation um, and show their support for that what sort of donations can people give so we have, I mean, we have something, our Poverty Action Week pin badges that people can get from our website, which is at charity-link.org. Really, any donations, some people choose to um, donate their winter fuel allowance. Some people get those and don't feel that they need it, and we can put that to really good use. But it really is a case that anything that's donated to us does make a difference. And actually, Charity Link works in quite a unique way that for every £10 that's donated to us, we can actually untap £50 worth of funding from um, charitable trusts around the UK. So, you know, you donate £10, we can actually purchase items worth £50, so it really does make a big difference. Highlights from the past seven days, the Rutland Radio podcast. Janet Armitage. Okay, so can you tell me a bit about the Cottesmore Military Wives Choir, please? Yes, the choir was formed uh, three years ago um, and has a complete range of ages so um, our youngest members are in their early 20s and our more senior members are in their 60s Um, and we're all either um, wives or uh, mothers or sisters um, or ex-serving military members Um, and we uh, actually are pretty active we do um, probably one or two events every month um, throughout the year um, so it's it's a great thing to belong to. Is it nice to have something all in common? Yes, of course, we all have the military in common uh, with us. We cover all three services. Um, I'm, for example, from a, a Navy background, um, but we definitely have the Army, as you would expect, being based at Cottesmore and lots of RAF involvement as well. And you are um, working on a new album at the moment. We are. It's really exciting stuff. Um, It being 100 years since the end of the First World War, the Military Wives Choir have had some new pieces of work, especially commissions, um, and we're all really busy learning the new pieces at the moment. Um, This coming weekend, um, members of the choir are going to Birmingham where they will meet with other members from other choirs. Um, First of all, to do amazing workshops with conductors and composers on Saturday and then on Sunday they're going to be recording for the album so everybody's really excited. So um, how long does it will it take to do this album? Um, they've been working um, behind the scenes since the end of last year. Um, they started doing recordings in the first weekend of January. So um, I know, for example, that a bunch of ladies went to Bristol a couple of weekends ago. Um, there was further recording last weekend in the north of the country, and there are a couple more weekends to go. And the album be uh, released later in the year. It's funded through Pledge Music. Um, so if people are interested, they can find us on uh, the website Pledge Music. Uh, forward slash projects forward slash MWC that's Military Wives Choir Lovely and um, are you looking for any members? Um, any new members? Yes we're always recruiting um, because the nature of the military life is that you get moved along Um, quite regularly. Um, We meet on Tuesday evenings at the uh, church uh, on the base at um, Kendrew Barracks at seven o'clock so um, if people who meet the 
the requirements of being a choir member um, are interested, then um, they should find the Military Wives Choir Cottesmore Facebook page, um, drop us a note, or even just search Military Wives Choir nationally. There's a link there. And um, we will uh, reply to your inquiry and indeed meet you at the gate if you don't have access to the to the um, base yourself. Rutland Radio's best bids on the podcast. My name is John Dearden. I'm with Stamford and Bourne Scout Active Support Unit. So tonight you've received a cheque from the Rotary Club um, for all your help and support uh, for the, um, the Santa Fun Run. So what was it like on the day, first uh, of all? It was very snowy, that is fair to say. And I think we ended up between four and six inches of snow. Uh, we arrived at 7am to put up the marquee, which was used as the main focal point for admin, etc. And we've supported the Santa Run for couple of years now doing that sort of thing and providing marquees and team to body up and power generation and stuff like that. So well deserved then? <laughs> well it's what we do. Yeah. Our role as active support unit in scouting in broad strokes is event management so we do the big camps, activities etc for scouts so it's only part of what we do for scouting and we're happy to convey that support into Rotary. So how did you feel when you were presented the cheque? Oh, thrilled to receive a nice donation like that. We received a donation of £1,000 today and it goes into what we do with scouting. It will go now forward to help fund the activities that we do and provide new activities Mm. for them or replace worn activities or even provide simple stuff like um, funding a a trip out somewhere, something like that. So so what sort of things do the scouts do and um, are you open for new members to join the Scouts? We're always open for new members and we do everything from simple crafts to full-on adventurous stuff including whitewater rafting, aerial runways, canoeing, kayaking, abseiling, rock climbing, hill walking, you name it, we do it all. As much adventure as you can get is what's available in scouting. And will you be back next fall? Not next year, this year, because we're in 2018. It will be this year. It's already in the diary, and uh, I think the team are already prepared for it with thick coats. (laughs) The Weekly Rutland Radio Podcast. Hello, I'm Roger Neal. I'm the president of the Stamford Burley Rotary Club this year. Tonight we're holding a, a special meeting to say thank you to the quite a number now of sponsors who supported us for the Santa Fun Run this year, which proved to be a great success, probably particularly because of the weather. We always say despite the weather, but in fact the weather actually probably helped quite a bit. <laughs> so yeah, we had all that snow, didn't we? But you, everyone still ploughed on, they carried on in the snow. Well, it was fabulous. I mean, we got to about 11 o'clock and I, th- I looked out and I thought, oh, goodness, there's only about 100 people going to turn up today to run, although we'd had 850-plus booked in. And um, within the next 20 minutes or so, a great crowd arrived and the total was probably nearer 500 who actually ran. And tonight you're presenting a cheque, so you're presenting one to the Scouts. We're presenting one to the Scouts tonight. Um, the, the Scouts, uh, we've always supported the Scouts, and tonight was an opportunity to give them this year's donation, particularly because they in turn have been... Um, well, what they do is they lend us their big marquees, or one of them this year. <laughs> Didn't have time in the snow to put two up. And... Um, they, they provide the labour, in effect, the, the older scouts come along to, uh, to help put them up. There is one other that um, has supported us uh, in terms of hard work for the, ever since we started 11 years ago, and that's Anne Corder Recruitment from Peterborough. And Anne and her mother previously, and her husband now, um, support us by bringing all the mulled wine... And her mother used to make the, the uh, mince pies. She used to make hundreds of them, but sadly, it, as she gets a little older, it's not very practical any longer, so we buy those in now. But uh, Anne comes every year. We put a tent up for her. She mold, um, puts the, the mulled wine on to brew, and uh, everybody who runs gets a glass of mulled wine and a mince pie. And then there's, there's one other sponsor who I particularly like to make note of, which is uh, Robert Wills, who owns the Falcon Hotel at Uppingham, who for the last... Well, probably not quite, but almost as many years as Anne, probably 10 years now, has uh, also sponsored this run. And um, we're very grateful to him. Well, that's it for this week's Rutland Radio podcast. If you have any comments, you can email us via the website, rutlandradio.co.uk, and we'll have a new version on our website from Monday. This is a download from Rutland Radio. For more information, go to rutlandradio.co.uk. 
This is a download from Rutland Radio. Hello and thank you for downloading the Rutland Radio podcast from rutlandradio.co.uk. This is where you can hear the best bits from the last week. So David, uh, you say about the, the church clock that you look after, it would actually be difficult to turn it off. Very difficult, yes. So uh, um, it, it, well, tell us about the, the, the clock itself and um, yeah, w- which church it is. Well, it's, um, it's the church in uh, Wissendine St Andrews at the top of the hill there. So it's the clock that's been there for probably something like 150 years. It's a you know, fairly standard sort of clock for that sort of church. Purely mechanical, it needs winding once a week. There's nothing electronic or complicated about it. So you actually couldn't really turn it off very easily if someone did say, you know, I've moved to the village, this is keeping me awake at night, what are you going to do about it? Indeed, yeah. You'd need to get some sort of specialist in who would probably charge hundreds and hundreds of pounds. You'd need to buy some equipment that would cost, you know, a whole pot of money as well. I suppose that's the same situation for so many churches around our area. They must have pretty similar movements. I would imagine so, yes. David, thanks very much for getting in touch with us this morning. OK, no problem. Rutland Radio. Melanie Turner. We're Level 3 Performing Arts Year 1. New College Stamford. Can you tell me a little bit about the performance that you've just done? So we did a short performance on the Srebrenica genocide in 1995, which was when they were a lot of people just maliciously murdered and it wasn't dependent on who they were or where they came from, just where they were in Srebrenica. Was it a difficult piece to work on? Yeah, it was... It was difficult kind of finding the truth in it, working on the unison and the ensemble work. We hadn't done much of that before as well, and we did it quite in a short span of time because it was based on a true story and it actually happened to from someone's account. And why do you think it's important for you to have done this performance today? Um, well, what happened was so recent and relevant and never gets talked about. I'd never heard of it before now. And, you know, people go to genocide when they think of the Holocaust and things like that, but it happens all over the world all the time. So I think it's good to show a variety and to make people help realise how relevant it is. Highlights from the past seven days, the Rutland Radio podcast. I'm Tony Storley and uh, I'm the Mayor of Stamford. It's Holocaust Memorial today and there is a lovely display in the town halls. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Yes, um, the Deputy Mayor actually organised this event and um, I've sort of supported it 100%. I'm very pleased the way it's worked out. It's uh, a good display. It shows the students have a lot of imagination, more than I have, I think. I've been to a lot of these concentration camps, so I'm well aware of the situation and uh, what the uh, conditions were. And uh, I think the illustrations and the paintings, etc., show it very well. So why is it important for us to have a Holocaust Memorial Day? It's very important. Um, Any country is susceptible to what happened very easily. It only takes a change of government and the wrong government and the wrong people and you've got the same again. And we've seen that in various countries. We've seen it in Africa. We've seen it in uh, Croatia. Uh, Yugoslavia, old Yugoslavia, can happen very easily. So young people especially have to be aware that voting is very important and looking after your country. Rutland Radio's best bids on the podcast. This week it was one U week with Leicestershire and Rutland Sport and Active Rutland, so I popped along to the road show at Oakham Library and got a few healthy tips from the experts. I'm Sarah West Sadler, I'm a registered nutritionist and my company is SWS Nutrition and I'm based in Oakham. So today I've brought along some ideas for healthy snacks, um, help people keep their energy levels topped up so we don't have to turn for those ready ready-made processed snacks that you don't know, do us no good. I've brought two with me today. Um, it's creating a bit of a smell actually over. Um, but I've got um, crispy kale, so crispy kale chips. Um, I want to say they're an alternative to crisps. Some people would beat me over the head with that. Um, but they're very tasty. Um, and the other one I've brought today are spicy roasted seeds. Um, so really simple to do. I've got two flavours. I've got chilli and sea salt and I've got uh, cinnamon and smoked paprika. Really delicious and really healthy to snack on as well. My name's Tony Otley and I'm the stop smoking advisor for the Rutland Stop Smoking Service. Biggest tip, the one tip that you would say to people who want to try and stop smoking? Give it a go. It might need quite a few attempts but persist at it because the health benefits are enormous.
an immediate health benefit from stopping smoking is a reduction in the carbon monoxide level in your blood, which already improves your circulatory system and gives you more energy because more oxygen can get round to the muscle tissues where it's required. Hello, I'm Jan. I'm a counsellor. I work for the Let's Talk Wellbeing Service. We help people with mental health problems like depression and anxiety. Most people feel I'm on my own, no one else feels like this, no one will understand, or they will think I'm going mad or something like that. It's not nice to tell someone that you're feeling a bit low, but actually we do encourage people, please, please, please do, because we understand, GPs understand, but we understand what they're going through and we can help them. So my name's Alex Smith um, and I'm a physiotherapist from Excellence Physio in Oakham. Physiotherapy services can help improve people with chronic pain, um, such as lower back pain, which is one of the biggest sufferers, um, and also how just little tips and um, sort of exercises that we can sort of give you today might be beneficial for you going forwards and hopefully reduce some of the pain. Rutland Radio. It's Rutland Radio. I'm Rob Pisani. Uh, this morning I have with me uh, four people from four different organisations who could help you um, if you're um, suffering with cancer or indeed you care for someone who does and it's uh, through a new project that really shows so many different organisations coming together uh, in our small county there's an incredible amount um, available to you if I could ask both each of you to to introduce yourself first that would probably make most sense then people will get a picture of exactly how it all fits together Starting with you, Mary. Oh, hi. I'm Mary Lem. I'm joint manager with Ruth Lees at Dove Cottage Hospice in Rutland, um, Ridlington. I'm Elaine Rutham, and I'm the Midmillan Volunteer Coordinator for Rutland. I'm Kirsty Vipond, and I run Hollyhocks Cancer Support Group in Stamford. I'm Jane Micklethwaite, and I help with the Rutland and Melston Support Group, which meets in Oakham once a month. And there are all these organisations. We've spoken about um, everyone before, but you, you really do... Um, all work together to offer something, I suppose, um, complementary. Elaine, how's this project come about that, that we're here to talk about? Well, I was given the role of setting up a new project in Rutland for Macmillan in partnership with Age UK, simply because we wanted to sort of get into the community and reach people that we probably couldn't reach. And it became apparent as I got to know people that there were other services that people didn't know about. So it's been a case of building up a relationship with them all and working together is far more effective. And we want to say to people, there are groups and organisations and people that can help you in Rutland. And we are all working together because we all offer something different. And this is for anyone um, aged over over 18. I know you coordinate it through Age UK, which people might think, you know, maybe was for people over 55, 60. Anybody over 18, we can help as long as they're dealing with cancer, but also their families and carers, because if it all works together, the carers quite often need help as well. And part of our role is signposting. So obviously we can refer to the other services as they can refer to the Macmillan service. Kirsty, tell us about Hollyhocks. Now, yours is led by complementary therapy? Yes, that is part of our offering. Yeah, Hollyhocks is now into its third year and is proud to have been a source of friendship and support to those living with and recovering from cancer. The group is every second Thursday of the month between 10 and 12 at Ketton Sports and Community Centre in Rutland. And you look after those who are going through it themselves, support yep, carers yep. and uh, those family members as That's well. That's right. As Elaine mentioned, the group's open to anyone affected by cancer, whatever stage of their journey or type of cancer. And again, we're open to carers, partners, relatives, and they're all offered a very warm welcome. And Jane, as Rutland and Melton Cancer Support, I mean, you're probably the longest standing local organisation that actually has been supporting people. Yes, it started 18 years ago. Somebody called Carol Morton, who lived in Oakham, who was wonderfully well looked after in hospital with ovarian cancer, came out and just felt incredibly lonely. There are a lot of people who feel very, very isolated, particularly when they get back from hospital, and uh, that some of their friends don't quite know what to do. 
and friendship and companionship and advice and keeping in touch. And we've been doing that now for 18 years. We regularly have about 30 people every Thursday and anybody is welcome at the Friends Meeting House, which is a lovely place to meet, in South Street, just opposite Tesco's, at the bottom of Jail Street. And if you have cancer or if you have a relative with cancer, do call and we'll be only too pleased to see you and try to help you in whatever way we can. Mary, Dove Cottage has been going for well, the same sort of time, but more kind of in the Vale of Beaver? It's been going for 20 years in the Vale of Beaver and people from Rutland were allowed to go, but what a long way. One year ago, the place was just right at Ridlington and so a hospice was the first one was started in Rutland. People get a little bit concerned what a hospice is but it, it used to be for the weary traveller but actually it's now for people with physical, emotional, social to give complete palliative care to people. It does give a diversional place for somebody to come to when they're suffering from a long-term condition but also gives the relatives an amazing day of rest for them but people can refer themselves. Um, it is run by volunteers is, but anybody who knows somebody they are able to refer themselves not just professionals. We're definitely feeling that we're getting more and more people coming to us through referrals and I would like to thank local businesses, doctor surgeries and hospitals because they really have helped us receive referrals and I think being diagnosed with cancer or someone you care about being diagnosed with cancer brings you know a whole host of emotions, feelings of anger, despair, fear and lack of control. But being in contact with others at a peer support group such as Hollyhocks, it can really help people share those concerns and fears and information and that is really empowering for carers and patients. Contact us. If one of us can't help, we'll know somebody that can. Yeah. And please, yes, use the services because that's what we're here for, to try and make life easier and more bearable for people and their families. Our biggest advert has been the people who have attended each of our four services. I've been working with cancer patients on and off for a very long time in Rutland and I don't think it's ever been a better opportunity now. The Cancer Support Group is getting referrals from Ketton, they're getting referrals from the hospice, we're getting referrals from Elaine herself who seems to be everywhere mm -hmm. and I think this is marvellous. It's a wonderful thing that we're all united in trying to produce the best we can for cancer patients. The weekly Rutland Radio podcast. I'm Sonia Brain. I'm chair of the Lettershire Carers Centre. We have a programme called Preparing to Care with Confidence. It's something that we've done for a number of years and it's for those people who care for somebody who's chronically ill or is disabled and very often those are the very, very people who are lonely and isolated and, and often caring comes as a, a sudden shock, something happens um, and people really don't know quite which way to turn. So this this programme is designed to give people the opportunity to meet with other carers and also to look at a number of different issues on, on different days. I suppose with being a carer, it's you feel like you've got a duty to look after your loved one, haven't you? But it can be a lot of work, a lot of stress at the same time. Absolutely, it can be. And, and, and as I said before, you often don't know what is out there, what support is available. Just getting together with other carers, we find, you know, some of the feedback that we have is fantastic because it's people that say it's great to be in the company of other people who are in a similar position. They know exactly where I, I am. I can remember one carer saying to me, she, she said, I took the brave step, I went out. And when I came back, my husband said, actually, you can go out again, you must go out again. We've got some new conversations, you know. You, you can bring the outside world into the person for whom you care. The event is going to be taking place at uh, Voluntary Action Rutland at their hub on Land's End Way in Oakham. It starts next Thursday, the 1st of February. first one is obviously an introductory session. They're, from, they're three hours long, from 10 in the morning till 1, which sounds like a long time, but actually we do need that time. So the first one is, is a kind of an introduction to what we're going to be doing, finding out a bit about each other. And then... The second one is around caring and coping, sort of get, looking at um, the emotional impact of dealing with somebody, looking after somebody, and ways in which you can help yourself to deal with some very difficult situations. We talk about emergency situations, about effective communication, all that kind of thing. And we often ask people to work together and look at their own situations. There might be a particular thing that's troubling them. So there's often an opportunity to look at how they might deal with that.
Well, that's it for this week's Rutland Radio podcast. If you have any comments, you can email us via the website, rutlandradio.co.uk, and we'll have a new version on our website from Monday. This is a download from Rutland Radio. For more information, go to rutlandradio.co.uk.